my name is John Warrington. I've been a full stack developer for many years, as can be evidenced by the thinning graying hair. I have worked with many different programming languages over the years, from classic ASP, PHP, Java, C Sharp. Currently, I'm working at a Canadian construction company, Clark Builders. And today, I'm going to talk about good code being a balancing act. <clears throat> so anyone that has been in the software industry for even a little while has probably heard it depends, which even when trying to write good code is the case. Anytime you try to enforce any kind of rules or recommendations, there will always be exceptions. So first, what do I mean? Good code. To me, good code means it should be quickly and easily understood. And obviously, it needs to work as intended, including performance, et cetera. And so bad code is anything that is not good code. Today, we're going to focus mostly on the easy, easily understood portion and show some examples where following the rules to the letter can actually lead to worse code. So in my early university courses, we were given the three rules that we had to follow for all assignments. They were strictly enforced by the electronic submission system that would actually reject your submission if you violated one of the rules. Each rule is meant to push you towards the good easy to read code, but when strictly enforced, can potentially lead to harder to read code. So the first rule was that a function could not be more than 10 lines long. Outside of university, I've never actually had a specific line length suggested, but I've definitely been told to keep my functions as short as possible. Anyone that has worked in software for a while has probably seen a function that looks kind of like this, where it's you know, way more than 10 lines. This function is actually in, in the code base at work, and it is pushing 2,000 lines. We haven't figured it out how to break it up yet. But this is what that 10 line long rule is trying to avoid. Comp large, hard, to read complicated functions. So the first suggestion is try to break it up into multiple function calls. So you get something like this. Obviously contrived examples, but gets the point across. However, it is still more than 10 lines long and would have been rejected in my university days. For most people, this is probably what you would actually strive for. But if you try to enforce that 10 lines rule, you need to break it up more. So you wind up with something like this. However, so now it fits the rules. However, if you are only focusing on the rules on for good code on one function, you're good. However, when you now try to look at the entire code base, it becomes difficult to figure out what is going on. So we want to see the code for part one. Well, it's broken up into multiple parts. So now we go and dig into part one again. And now it's broken up into multiple feet parts and you can just get lost trying to find what it is you're looking for so you got to be careful the other extreme is when you try to actually force all the code into a single in, into the single function of less than 10 lines which starts to remind me of the obfuscated C code contests. 
there's lots of ways to try to combine too much code into a, a little bit of space. However, it becomes difficult to understand very, very quickly. I have worked with people that have tried to do this. I don't recommend it. So rules trying to enforce keeping functions short, which is a good thing because it helps maintain that they're easily understood. But an arbitrary line limit doesn't work very well. So you'll have to find the balance between the readability of your function versus the readability of the entire code base. The second rule was we were only allowed to include one control structure per function. So we could only have one if statement or one for loop, one switch statement, one while loop. We could not have multiples. I'm sure most people think of several situations where that's very inappropriate limitation. Pretty much any complex code is going to need more than one. For example, here's a switch statement that has an if in part of each piece, which that right there is would be considered three control structures in university. So that obviously does not work. The example that we always ran into in the first year university was looping over a multi-dimensional array. So you wind up with nested for loops. You could you know, obviously have one of the loops be another function call, but that now is adding to your call stack, et cetera. The other way, I think, way would be to do a single dimensional array, just with each row being further on down the array. But now that adds complexity with math. <clears throat> Although most methods, most, lang most languages have methods now, so you don't have to loop over an array like this very often. Another example would be manually looping over an array to find a particular element. So you now have a for loop with an if statement inside. Again, there's two control structures. If the trinary operator had existed in the languages we were using, might have been able to get away with using that instead of the if statement in your inside of a for loop. However, this is now another balance issue over readability and simplification. Personally, I used to think the trinary operator was difficult to understand and would prefer if else. Over the years, I've actually kind of come to like it. So, you know, even your judge of what's easy to read does change over time. So that was another rule that was pushing for balance, like maintaining the level of complexity, trying to keep all your functions as simple as possible. The third rule was we were only allowed one return statement per function. There are people that try to enforce that as it is as well. And it's not a bad thing, but it can make things more difficult to read. Having multiples can get confusing as to where the function is being returned from. This is a simple example of a, 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 a switch that could potentially return one or two different values, plus it has fallback values. It's not overly complicated, but it gives an example of four different return calls. So 
the obvious way to do it is set a val variable. So we set return value and return that at the end. It doesn't really help un there's any understanding of how the value gets set because the value is still set throughout the function, but there is only the one return statement. So you know you have to get to the bottom of the function before it returns. Personally, I like to do any kind of a parameter check right up front and fail out of the function quickly, which reduces that nesting in the if statement. Just to make it slightly easier. And then yes, aim for potentially a single return value throughout the rest of the function. Again, pushing for simplification of the individual functions, certain situations, single return becomes more complicated because you actually wind up with nesting, et cetera. Find the right balance for you and your team. So all three of the rules were about keeping functions short and easy to understand. In some situations, following the rules to the letter will actually make things worse. So I recommend understanding what they're trying to accomplish, find the balance between the two, and go with that. So next rules are more for more compiled languages like C Sharp, Java, C++. And the recommendation is use interfaces. They provide the ability to mock parts of your application away for testing or to provide different implementations, both of which are great reasons to do so. Here's a simple example. You have a re user repository that stores users. It allows you to easily substitute for other possible implementations. So we have a database version or a file version. This is the reason for using it. However, I have run into places where everything, there is no class in the system that does not have, implement an interface. The interface is exactly the same as class. There is no options, like there, there's no other implementations. There's nothing that needs to be tested. For example, a user, if there is no other implementation, why is it an interface? If you need to make any changes to it, you're now making changes in multiple places, which becomes difficult. The other extreme is no interfaces at all, at which point testing or needing to implement a different implement, you know, have, have a different implementation will cause you great difficulty. So yes, when using interfaces, try to only use them as needed. So you find the balance between not enough and too many. Make sure you have an interface when there's a good chance of needing another implementation and not use one where the likelihood is low. And if you don't have one and you do need one, modern IDEs generally have pretty good refactoring tools that allow you to extract an interface. Now, naming, variable and function naming. Generally, rule is functions, variables, classes, et cetera, all should have a descriptive name. I have seen that there is a balance between not being descriptive enough and being too descriptive. I'm sure we've all found names like this, I, A, X, temp, et cetera. It becomes difficult to know what anything is. In, you know, in looping counters, 
I'm still okay with eyes. X, Y are fine if you're using coordinates, but otherwise, you know, you should try to put in something a little more descriptive. However, I have run into functions that are named like this. But you probably don't want a name that long. Trying to type it is difficult. IDs do have tend to fill things in for you, which makes life easier. But there's a really big cognitive load trying to understand what that function actually does. In this case, it probably is violating all the previous rules as it's doing way too many things. <laughs> so you need to find your balance between names that are too long, too short, descriptive, not descriptive enough. And now I want to touch just briefly on comment. I have been told you should always comment your code. I have also been told you shouldn't need to have comments as your code should be self-documented. So again, the extremes, no comments at all, which this being a simple function, you can generally understand what it's doing. But as soon as you get something more complicated, you probably do want a few comments about why it's doing what it's doing. The other extreme is commenting everything. Why you need to comment about the end of the for loops, explaining that it's an array definition, explaining that you're getting the number of columns when the function's called get column count. It's a waste of time. Chances are they won't get removed or updated as the code changes. It causes problems. So you'll need, you want to find a balance. You need, so all the previous rules should help with your self-documenting code, meaning that functions should be relatively easy to understand and knowing what it's doing. But there are situations where what's supposed to be happening should also be documented because it is a more of a complex thing, but don't try to document how it's doing the calculations or doing the algorithm, as chances are the implementation will change over time, but the comments won't get updated, which may, will just make life worse for anyone coming into that code in the future. So the recommendation, document why the function or the code is doing what it's doing, and only need add them as needed when it's not clear what the function's doing. And remember, you won't have a clue what you is doing next week or six months from now. So yes, there is always a balance between following your rule to the letter versus following the spirit of the rule. And you need to find the balance for you, your team, and your company. Just because you find something easy to read does not mean that your team or your company will. So you'll have to find a compromise between all those people and strike the perfect balance. And that would be all I had. If you have any questions for me, you can find me on Twitter and email me at work. Uh, thank you. Hey, it's Joe Eames with ng-conf. If you like that video, be sure to click subscribe either here, or here, or somewhere over here. And if you're looking for something more, here's another video for you to watch here or there or somewhere.